Hello. The programme you're about to see is intended to help patients who've recently been diagnosed as having cancer. But there's also information for patients and their relatives and friends about the two most common forms of treatment apart from surgery. That's to say chemotherapy and radiotherapy. The programme has been written not only by doctors and nurses who are experienced in the management of patients with cancer, but by patients themselves who've actually undergone a course of treatment. We've tried to cover as much ground as possible and you'll probably find the information quite concentrated so you might need to watch the programme more than once. The hope is that it will help you and your family with some of the decisions which often have to be made at this time and perhaps it will also help you cope with some of the ups and downs of the treatment that lies ahead of you. As hospital departments are run in different ways and treatment policies vary from one region to another, this programme aims to provide a general overview rather than dwelling on specific factors, which may vary from one patient to another, even with the same tumour type. Your specialist doctor or oncologist will consider many factors in great detail in order to tailor make treatment for each patient. Before you start, the treatment will be discussed with you. If you accept this course, you will be asked to sign a consent form. The main object of this form is to clarify that you fully understand the treatment and are aware of any potential side effects. Chemotherapy is the use of chemicals and radiotherapy is the use of x-rays to treat patients with cancer. Not all patients with cancer need to be treated with chemotherapy and radiotherapy, but many get one and others may even require both. It should have been made clear to you which of these treatments you will be having. Chemotherapy is the use of drugs or chemicals to treat cancer. Your cancer specialist has a choice of over 50 different drugs, which can be used as single agents or in a variety of different combinations. Factors such as the extent of your disease, your general condition and the function of your liver and kidneys are taken into account. For this reason, a number of tests are required before the start of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is normally given in cycles, most commonly three to four weeks apart to a total of four to six months. You can see in this graph that between cycles, your body's normal cells, that's the top line, recover, but the tumour cells, that's the bottom line, do not. Over the entire chemotherapy course, it's hoped that all the tumour cells would have been destroyed, leaving the body a little battered, but intact. In most cases, the exact dose of chemotherapy given to you is calculated by measuring your height and weight, then working out your surface area. In this way, treatment is individualised for each patient. These doses of chemotherapy may be modified during the whole course of treatment based on your reaction to treatment and the further blood and urine tests. Chemotherapy can be given in the form of oral tablets or as a liquid injected into a vein in your arm using a device known as an intravenous cannula. Alternatively, it can be injected into a larger vein in the front of your chest via an apparatus called a central line. Central lines are permanent catheters introduced into a large vein before the start of chemotherapy, which avoids you having to have a new cannula for each course. Also, it allows you to have blood taken without additional injections. It was basically a tube that came out of my chest and, um, and they could inject all my drugs through there, all my chemo drugs, and, um, and they could also take blood out of there and it just meant that I wasn't used as a pincushion. I didn't end up with loads of holes up my arms. Most chemotherapy drugs are given as an outpatient. Sometimes the drugs have to be preceded by intravenous fluids, and this has to be given as an inpatient, staying usually one or two nights. An alternative way of administering chemotherapy is with a continuous infusion pump. In this situation, a drug is carried in a cassette and infused continuously into a central line, while the individual is able to be fully mobile at home or work. 
We would now like to explain the reasons why chemotherapy is recommended for some patients. There are three main reasons for being given chemotherapy. Firstly, there are those who are having adjuvant chemotherapy. This means that they've had a tumour removed with surgery or radiotherapy, but chemotherapy is added as an insurance policy to reduce the chance of it returning in another part of the body in the future. The second category is where chemotherapy aims to cure as the main form of treatment. This treatment tends to be quite intensive, has to be modified regularly, and is usually associated with quite a lot of side effects. The third category is where the aim is not to cure, but to control a specific symptom caused by the tumour. This is sometimes known as palliative treatment. The aim of this treatment is to improve the quality of life. Therefore, the side effects from the chemotherapy shouldn't outweigh the benefits of shrinking the tumour. In these latter two categories, your oncologist would require a full reassessment of your disease after two or three cycles to check whether chemotherapy is working effectively. If not, the chemotherapy regime could be changed. The side effects of chemotherapy depend on which drug or combination of drugs are used. Before you start chemotherapy, your oncologist and specialist nurse would have described which side effects you are most likely to experience. Yes, you know, I, was, I was told all oh, I'd have quite. A, I could experience quite a lot of side effects, but in my particular instance, I must be lucky. But they haven't really bothered me at all. We will now describe the more common side effects, but this doesn't necessarily mean you will have them, and you may have others not described here. The blood is formed in the bone marrow, which is the spongy substance in the centre of your bone. The three main elements of the blood are the red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets. Chemotherapy can affect all three elements. If you do not have enough red blood cells, you will become anemic, causing tiredness, breathlessness on exertion and dizziness. Low numbers of white blood cells causes susceptibility to infection, and any infection you have will be more serious. If your platelets are low, you will be prone to bleeding, either nosebleeds, blood in the urine, heavier periods, or you may find yourself bruising more easily. If you have any of these symptoms, you should report them to your specialist nurse or oncologist. In particular, if you have an infection and a raised temperature, you need an admission into hospital for antibiotics into a vein. In some cases, it is possible to protect the red blood count with a substance called erythropoietin. This boosts the production of red cells in the blood, protecting patients from anemia and reducing the need for transfusion. In other cases, it is possible to protect the white blood count by using a substance known as granulocyte colony stimulating factor, or GCSF. This works by increasing the production of a certain type of white blood cell, which is particularly important in helping your body fight infection. After chemotherapy, your white cells tend to drop, leaving you more susceptible to an infection. By injecting GCSF, your white cell count increases, and therefore your risk of fever and infection decreases. This has been confirmed in clinical studies, which have also shown that GCSF reduces the need for antibiotics and the amount of time a patient spends in hospital. GCSF is given as an injection under the skin for five to seven days after the end of each cycle of chemotherapy. This can be given by the nurse at home, although some patients or their relatives learn to give it themselves. GCSF is not required in all cases. Your oncologists would have considered using it from the start of your chemotherapy or may well decide to add it to your treatment if your blood count has dropped after your first or second cycle, or if you have developed a problem with infections. Many, but not all, of the drugs will cause hair loss. Sometimes the hair will fall out gradually after the first or second cycle of drugs, and usually grow back after the end of chemotherapy. Once the hair starts falling out, it's best to have the hair cut short, and if you like, a wig ordered in plenty of time. Some drugs can cause nausea and even vomiting, 
That is why they're always given with the addition of anti-sickness medication, including steroids, which usually controls the nausea. Some of the more unusual side effects include changes to the nails, diarrhoea, dryness of the skin, problems with hearing, mouth ulcers, and pins and needles in the fingers and toes. Again, it is stressed that the risk of getting these side effects should have been explained to you before you start treatment. Many patients often ask, what can I do to help during treatment? Well, here are some suggestions. During chemotherapy, it's important to keep the mouth clean with regular brushing and dental flossing. You may have been given a liquid to prevent candida or thrush infections, which you should take regularly. It's best to avoid irritants, such as smoking and spirits, but small amounts of alcohol, if desired, are perfectly acceptable. Try and get plenty of sleep and eat healthy foods, such as fresh fruit and vegetables. If your appetite is poor, try to eat little and often. Relatives or friends may like to help keep a record of the side effects of the treatment in order to tell the medical staff at each of your visits. Within the first 24 hours of having my first cycle of chemotherapy, I started to feel the benefits and my breathlessness um, didn't feel breathless anymore.